Ja, hello, good evening, friends. So this is the second edition of the uh, Stuyvesant Trend uh, event. All the books which are here on front of this table had been created this summer, and we are highlighting some of the books with book signings with certain artists, and a special highlighting highlight is by today. Uh, to talk with Robert Polidori, uh, Joel Sternfeld, Frank Golke, and uh, Meta about uh, three new book publications. And um, as you know, I'm always saying uh, that I'm for sure not an artist, and my my job is to work with the artist, and that with the artist, and that I'm the technician, the helping hand. Um, everything what an artist has not available to release a book. I'm uh, the helping hand to finish it and to get it into a physical reality. And so my idea is uh, that the artists speak about their books and after that I give a short technical description how the book has been released on press which kind of paper has been used, because I know uh, that here are a lot of people who are interested in those matters. So at first the artist and after that the technician. And uh, the stage is for Robert Polidori. Uh, I have released with him two books this fall. Uh, one has the title 60 Feet Road and the other is Hotel Petra. Okay, thank you, Gerhard, and thank you, Strand, for, this is my second time, at, are you hearing me okay? Okay, my second time at Strand, I'll be much more brief than the first time, and I won't say any, like, outrageous stuff, because in this electoral um, cycle, we've heard a lot, so I'm going to be really diplomatic, and, uh, you know, and, um, you know, harmonic. Uh, plus, I don't feel so great, I've been sick for three weeks, so my, my energy's down. So I'm going to keep my comments just on bookmaking. Um, the first book I made was not with Steidl. I made three or four books prior to meeting Gerhard Steidl. When I lived in France, um, I started to shoot in Versailles in 1983. And by the time it was 1988, I thought, this would be great in a book. And um, I used I shopped around I knew nobody and uh, I would get these agents who like would write down on pieces of paper go see these people go see these people all these editeurs in Paris and um, finally I met someone and I said look I want to do a book about historical revisionism as seen through museum restoration they said What's that? They says, we want to make our most beautiful book on Versailles. I said, well, okay. I could only get that. I said, I'll take it, I guess. One book is better than no book. And I think I waited four years for them to get um, a foreign co-editor. And, uh, and I waited and waited and was quite impatient. And then... Uh, finally, when they were ready to make the book, they gave me a text that was written by a, an academic person, and they said, well, you have to read this text, and then you have to figure out which picture goes with what page. I said, what? This was not my idea of what, uh, what that book should be like, but I was forced to do that. And I, I like to point out that since then, um, I, I have this secret need for revenge that as I'll really be well known when they'll give me an author and I can say, page, paragraph one deals with this, and I want three subjective clauses. So um, I moved back to New York, I think, in 96. And I had another body of work. And um, I was visited by someone from Hatje Kantz. And then they, um, 
uh, they said, wow, we'd love to do this book. This was like the Havana book where they said, but um, you know, we only do books if the, the author participates. And that meant like 10 or $20,000, I forget how much that was. And I simply didn't have it then. And, and one um, thing I'm missing in my memory is how I actually, who introduced me to Gerhard? I actually, I forget, but I remember meeting him at Pace Gallery um, storage space somewhere. And he said, I want to do this book. And then he says, just give me some prints. And when I come back, I'll show you what it would look like. So I said, okay. And I gave him some really bad eight by 10 press prints that I had. And I think two or three months later, he was back in New York and I got a call and then he actually like printed, he made um, a maquette of the book uh, um, that was, I guess, hand bound, but it looked like it was, you know, a really, a real bound book. And he, and with um, actually lithographically printed five or six images of the book with blank sort of pages. See, the book shall be like this. And this, and, and I said, oh, I, that never happened to me before. And then um, I came, uh, so we made a, a, an appointment or a time when I should go to Germany, to Göttingen. And then, and I realized once I was there that he owns a whole factory that there's a real vertical integration that's taking place here. And I want to point out how really rare that is in the publishing world. I don't know of any other person who has that. Um, and so that was the Havana book. And um, that was a really great success for me, even though that Gerd and I will both say it wasn't, because we we fought and argued a little bit about that about because black and gray and I made some errors um, and I'm much better now than I was then but hopefully so that was in maybe 2000 we've I've learned so much from him because you know I didn't my first books they kept me out of all that stuff so I had no hands-on um, expertise. Books are important to me because, you know, I never studied photography ever. I sort of fell into photography. I studied cinema because I'm interested in temporality as a subject matter. And um, I came to photography uh, because of, um, of, my, of my interest in memory and mnemonic systems. I read a book called The Art of Memory by Francis Yates and spoke about ancient memory systems where students would have to memorize uh, some empty rooms. And I realized that somehow empty rooms look better in photography than they do in cinema because in, in the old in the um, analog cinema days, you know, the grain vibrated in, in the room. It looked like the room vibrated, where in a, in a print of a room, it, it looks eternal up there, like on the wall, as if the wall and the image of a wall are sort of isomorphic. Um, well, anyway, um, the book structure, uh, uh, and I want to say another thing, too, that um, my favorite photo book, where say um, that the book is an actual work in itself, is a book by Michael Snow called uh, Cover to Cover, which was published in 1974. Um, any, uh, does anyone here know that book? Okay, Garrett knows that book because this is to me the most brilliant book ever made or one of them anyway. Um, uh, because in fact, the, work, the book itself is a work in itself. And I'm gonna get back to this concept like, like at the end, but um, one of the things that intrigued me about the um, structure of a book in uh, as far as its temporal development is that one, the viewer 
uh, chooses when he turns the pages. And I say turn the pages because it's binary. Well, the first page is single. Then all of the following ones, except for the last page, it's a binary thing. It's like there's two pages with this strange little crease. Now you can go across the gutter and have it be one image, which I never liked. I never, I didn't know what metaphorically it means, the gutter. For me, it meant like a cut. So I try not to go across the gutter, but over time I've like, uh, I'm less um, uh, strict with myself. But um, so it's kind of a binary uh, thing which you're given here. And I always thought that one of the images had to relate see, to the other. I always preferred a kind of a book structure where meaning grows through a sense of accretion. That is, as you turn the pages, there's a greater and greater meaning or content development that's being made. But this is not the only way, there's sort of catalog kinds of books where somehow as you turn the page it makes you forget the preceding page so it's like a mono monotheistic view if you will um, um, so yeah for me um, even when I shoot photographs I always have had a, a sort of an end product of a book or at least a developing structure that you go from point A to point B and um, with clues like sometimes you want to backtrack in the book. Um, um, it deals with sequence. Um, working um, at Steidl's place, uh, at Gerhardt's place in Gottingham. Uh, most of the people come there with their books more structured than mine are. I actually spend a lot of time there. Somehow I, I try to take in the vibes and um, uh, there's a certain ambiance there that um, I don't mind waiting a long time as some do because somehow it it psychologically helps me um, and uh, for a lot of the people other sort of photographers who go there I always say try and enjoy it um, um, I've gained from it and um, Lots of development one of the things I feel very sort of privileged about is in the since 99 or 2000 that I started to go there. I've seen this whole, uh, you know, the, the movement from analog to digital has gone a long way. My view on all of that is like I pick and choose. I'm a hybrid person. So I try to get the best of both and combine them. Um, I want to wrap it up and say that I'm very proud of this book that I've completed 60 Feet Road because, like I mentioned earlier, I've been for 40 years a fan of who I think the greatest artist of born in the previous century, whose name is Michael Snow. Um, you know, I quit college after seeing his film Wavelength. Um, it was for me, as Annette Michelson would say, a conversion, the way that people use religious conversion. And if, there is the, if there's a religion that's attached to this film, I would call it temporality. Uh, I, in fact, Michael always said this film is a monument to time. Um, and I'm very proud of this book that I did because finally, after 40 years or 44 years, I think I've made a book that has um, uh, digested all of the, or not, some of the l language, iconographic language that Michael pioneered. In, in as much as I feel that this book, 60 Foot Road, is 
a, finally a work in itself. And it's about the making of a work and its and its um, découpage and its uh, um, how it was assembled and how it's disassembled. Um, and I hope that uh, I'll be inspired by my own work now to be able to do more books of this type. Okay. Um, do I ask about questions or not? No. No, there's no questions. Then we go to the next person. I hope I was entertaining enough. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Before we go to the next person, I promised to talk a little bit about technical matters. Um, not about 60 feet road, but uh, while I was working with Robert on this book, um, he told me uh, that the book is showing an ideal perspective. And uh, when you look carefully to the photography of 60 Feet Road, you see uh, it is a kind of illusion. The, the series of photos is starting in the morning, it is ending in the evening, and what you see in the book is the reality because it is uh, analog photography. But he worked very special with lenses and also the photo composition of the uh, entire work makes it a dream perspective, so something what is not real, what you can only find in this book, and I think it, it, it is a masterpiece of uh, photography. And therefore, I do not want to speak about my printing because that's absolutely secondary. But um, Robert did not speak about the other book we did at the same time, what was called Hotel Petra. Uh, this is uh, this is a building in uh, Beirut, and um, it is um, his special way of. Um, of uh, taking shots from the ruin. Uh, the building itself it does not exist by today, uh, so the photo is again a document. And releasing this book, um, it, is, uh, it is very special. So the paper I have used here is, is a new composition. Um, I created this paper with a German paper mill Schleipen. And, um, as you know, uh, uncoated papers, when they are very rough, they don't deliver really a good uh, photo quality. And it is very easy for printers to print uncoated papers. And um, I, all my lifetime, I did research to print good and to have good results on cheap papers. And, uh, and because they have more emotion than the coated papers. And this paper here uh, is uh, prepared uh, with a metal in the surface, uh, which is titanium oxide. And this makes it that the ink does not sink into the paper. It sits on top. And it is printed with, uh, with a very special high pigmented pigmented inks. And the result is really amazing. The, you have a quality and a brilliance like on coated paper. But it is really a simple, very simple, uncoated stuff. Uh, which is normally used for printing uh, fiction literature. And um, outside we have used a cloth uh, of a very high quality and when I did uh, test printing I found the result uh, boring and uh, it, it was not uh, looking really good to be compared with the pages inside. And so I turned the cloth around and printed on the back side, so the uncoated side, so that was more a planned accident, and uh, it matches perfect with the uh, with the quality of the photos inside. So uh, this is just a lesson uh, that um, not gold and diamonds and ivory are uh, that what we are looking for in making books. So that also what I learned once from Joseph Boyce that garbage and the materials you normally throw away or the back sides of the fine stuff is more interesting to release books. So, and uh, now uh, Joel Sternfeld, uh, Frank Golke and Siku Meta. Uh, the book was printed uh, 
three or four weeks ago and uh, on Monday morning I rece re received uh, fresh copies from the bindery and uh, one of my specialities or one of my uh, um, yeah, long uh, time relationship with Joel Sternfeld is that I carry always the new books in suitcases with Lufthansa to New York. So we packed it on Tuesday morning and uh, the first books are here at the Strand Bookstore worldwide available by today. And uh, may I ask you to talk a little bit about this making of the book, making this book. <laughs> Okay, let me translate that cryptic little story about Steidel being a courier. Um, in the dark days after September 11th, um, those of us who were working to save the High Line got word that the people who were fighting to tear it down were using the chaos of the period, including um, um, the Giuliani administration, and they had signed tear-down orders. And the High Line was actually slated to be torn down. And so the friends of the High Line immediately went to court to, for a stop work order, and I had been photographing the High Line for about a year, a year and a half. I didn't feel quite ready to do a book, but I felt like it was important to do it right then and there. Uh, this is roughly October 2001. And uh, again, Steidel seems to hold his meetings at Pace Gallery, in the back room of Pace Gallery. He takes it over as an office. And so I met with Gerhardt on October 15th, which in and of itself was unusual because very few people were coming to New York in, in the aftermath of those events. And uh, I said, you know, I'd like to do a book about the High Line. And he said, you know, sure, we can do a little book. And he immediately got out his ruler and his, you know, pencil. And we designed the book in the back room of Pace. And he said, no, could I ask no pictures, please, right now? They, they, I find it. I, I'm a photographer, that's why I hate having my picture, you know, it, it, you understand. Um, so, um, we, he said, send some prints, that seems to be his MO, and I, I, I sent some prints over to, uh, to Göttingen, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, you come over in uh, maybe two weeks, and I came over, and we printed this little book, uh, Walking the High Line, and uh, then there I had a show scheduled at Pace that was supposed to be portraits, but I switched it. it would d a December show opens on December 6th, and I switched it to a Highline show. And um, now it's the week before the show, and I know the book has been published or printed. There are no books in New York. And I'm trying to be cool. I, I was new in my relationship with Gerhardt. I didn't want to, you know, kind of act like an anxious author. So I didn't say anything. And the show is going to open on a Tuesday. It's Wednesday before. I say nothing. Thursday, nothing. Friday, nothing. Saturday, there's no deliveries. Sunday, there's no deliveries. Monday, the gallery is cl closed. I called up the accountant who came in on Mondays. I said, Frankie, we get any boxes of books? No. So that night at about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, I called up Gerhardt. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And of course he's in the factory sweeping up the floors. With, uh, not joking. He, you know, he gets back from the fashion show in Milan. First thing he does is sweep the floor. It's therapy. Uh, or I don't know what it is, but it, he's sweeping the floors. <laughs> So I interrupted him from sweeping the floors, and I said, Gerhard, I just want to say that there are no books in New York. And he said, what? You know, he, he, they were done last Thursday. They went to FedEx in Frankfurt. Um, and um, I said, I, I have to wait till they open at 7 o'clock. I'll find out. And um, 
it turned out that they had been loaded on a in a package that was too large it exceeded fedex's requirements for a pallet and so gerhardt this is we're now in the the mythical part of the story but uh stay with it uh got a courier and with a couple of suitcases and evidently they loaded up these suitcases with books and got him on the first flight to New York that day which was I think the 11 a.m. flight uh, he flew to New York with the time difference he landed at 2 o'clock at 5 o'clock in the afternoon when I walked into Pace Gallery there were books but the interesting part is that ev evidently, in order to get a courier, a ticket loaded up with books through, cust through, uh, through the airport, through security, he had to hold up the flight. And, and, and the, the legend is that he called up Chancellor Schroeder. <laughs> well, if you publish Gunter Grass, you can call up Gre uh, Chancellor Schroeder. Uh, and so, I don't know if the story is true, but I just thought I'd pass it along for your <laughs> consideration. <laughs> so, I'm gonna be brief, because I also want Frank and Sukitu to speak. Um, but, books are supposed to be hard. I don't know what it says about this book, but this one was not hard. This was a great pleasure. I'm talking about the book, Landscape as Longing, Queens, New York. Um, Diane Shamish was someone who put together art commissions. She called up Frank, she called up me. She said, Queens College is looking for people to do an artwork for their new building. Would you document Queens? And I had already been thinking about Queens I had photographed in the Bronx in the 1980s when it looked like, like a war zone. And I had begun to notice in the 90s changes in the Bronx that you, you, if you think back, it's a New York audience, yes? You remember when the fact that there was a CVS in the Bronx was amazing? You know, it was like, you know, that was different. And, and things, I mean, Brooklyn was ascending in the normal gentrified way, but Queens was doing something else. And it, it was like that little Peruvian place that was ma made to look like a mountain shack restaurant in, in, in the hills of Peru was being built and it was being cleaned up, it was getting a little bit of neon, and something was happening in Queens, and I had noticed it. So when the call came, uh, would you photograph Queens, I, I was really thrilled. It was something I was interested in. And um, it, it was wonderful to be in Queens in the early 2000s. Um, it felt like, despite September 11th, it felt like hope was on the rise. It was a very aspirational time. I think things have gotten wealthier and less interesting now. But back then, it, it felt low tech and it, or it felt uh, hopeful in a much more simple way. Uh, and at least this is what I projected onto the landscape. Of course, when, when you're a photographer and you make these sweeping statements, it's, you're always wrong because that's your projection and for somebody else it's something altogether different. But uh, to me it felt like you could look out at the landscape and see hope written visible in the built landscape. And so that's what the work was about for me, and I, I won't speak for Frank, but I, it was not unrelated, I think. And, um, and so we did the work, and uh, I'm gonna embarrass Frank and say what really made it such a, a great experience for me was Frank and I knew each other. I had showed up late one year in 1985 for New Year's because my <laughs> car had 
gone into the snow three, two times, not once, but two times on the way to Minneapolis. Uh, you know, we knew each other. He knew what I was. But uh, uh, I really got to know Frank. You know, we didn't work together, but then we had coffee or dinner together. And, uh, you know, and to know him is to love him. And he, he stacked the audience. Half of you are his family or friends. And, uh, and I, I don't blame you. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, so that made it great. And then having Sukitu, who we, I had read Maximum City, and to have him come along and join this effort, it, it's just been a, 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 a really great experience doing this book. Uh, you know, there's a Spanglerian theory that it's the difficult time, the inhospitable environment that makes for great art. Um, m maybe that means that uh, this is not such a good book, but we had a good time. <laughs> and I, I just want to ever so briefly concur with Robert. Uh, the idea of doing books, first of all, the, I think book is the final form for the photograph, or you, you know, the the photograph finds its most powerful place in book. You know, uh, fo the individual photograph of the 1950s uh, that flew sua sponte to the museum wall and contained the truth. Actually, that photograph has been taken down and hasn't been seen in 40 years. You know, you sell individual photographs. They're in closets, you know, they're, they're one or two of them are up, but they're not with the other 65 that you made that go with that picture that create a cumulative meaning. And it, it was Evans who said that no individual photograph contains a truth, but cumulatively a group of photographs might. So I, to, I think it book is a very important form. And what Steidel adds to the mix besides titanium oxide that he gives to special photographers <laughs> and not other photographers <laughs> uh, is, is um, the possibility to, to think as a working artist that you're not going to have to spend two years shopping your book after it's done, that it's going to go to press, and that you can make statements amongst your bodies of work, that you, can, that you can not only make a book a coherent statement, but that if you would, you can make a cumulative statement amongst several bodies of work. And um, I, you know, I think that's, for me, the ultimate moment for a photographic artist. You know, we've had the luxury of working with Steidel. It's available to, I feel sorry for young photographers, but it also is available in squib form, self-published books. It's available in websites, but it's a new moment. You know, I think Evans did one monograph in his lifetime, and now people like us have this rare pr privilege of making a, a deep, lifelong statement through many books. And, you know, it couldn't be uh, a more generous thing that you do. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you, Joel. It was very nice things you said about me. Um, and I would say the same things about you. I know, you sold me that way, so uh, that's hard to live up to. Uh, I'll try. Um, Joel and I were acquaintances. We liked one another. We liked one another's work. And when I got the call from Diane Shamish, I found out also that Joel was being considered for the same commission. And I thought, you know, I like Joel, and I think he likes me, and uh, why should we compete for a pretty big pie when we could just collaborate and share it? And so 
I, to I asked Joel, would you like to do that? And he said, oh, I've never collaborated with anyone before. I don't know how to do it. I said, well, I don't really either, but I figure we'll work something out. So we proposed it to Diane, and she said, sure, why not? So uh, that's how it started. And we began actually trying to photograph together, and that lasted about five minutes. Uh, and even just the minimal amount of collaboration involving, oh, I just saw something I think you'll like, and it's here, or Joel, you gotta get over here right now because this is going away in the next 15 minutes and if you're not here, you're gonna hate yourself for the rest of your life <laughs> once I tell you what you've missed. Uh, that didn't work because both of us are inveterate wanderers and we wander in very different paths and we stop for different things, utterly different things. I mean, I think Joel's part of this book uh, creates a cast of characters that inhabit a landscape that I ended up, I think, creating a kind of perverse travelogue to. These are things that, for the most part, nobody would look twice at. Uh, I showed this work uh, at Howard Greenberg Gallery in 2009 or 10, I think. And um, someone said of the pictures that I made things that are so ordinary that they almost repel attention. <laughs> and I don't think that was meant as a compliment, but it made me feel like I've done it. God damn it, I've done it finally, you know? You're looking at something that you would never look at if that picture weren't there. And I'm not saying it was because the picture was so great, but, you know, the stuff is interesting. It's just all interesting. And I think one of the great things about photography is the way in which it can redeem the world, the ordinary world that we live in, and think, why aren't things more interesting? Well, they are. You just open your eyes, you know? Uh, it doesn't take a photograph to prove it. You can prove it to yourself. As far as working with Steidl, I can't tell you how thrilled I was when I spoke to him and he said he would like to make some books of my work. Because books had never occurred to me as a form because I think my first attempts met that solid wall of, well, I don't see any market for this book. Nobody's going to buy it. You know, why should we spend all of this money to publish it? And I think one of the, one of the unfortunate things about today's publishing scene for young artists is they all end up having to raise money. And some of them are very ingenious at it, but a lot of them go into debt. You know, it's just all on their credit cards. And there they are. They've got a great book. Uh, but the problem is still that the market is only so large. And, you know, we're flooded with books, and I can't keep up with them. Nobody can keep up with them. But they're, you know, I can't believe that three quarters of them aren't worthwhile, at least, and probably 90 or 95 percent. So f it's feast or famine, and now it's a feast, but uh, in some ways it's still a famine for young photographers who are trying to get the attention that they believe their work deserves, and they're probably right. Working with Gerhardt on this book, and it's my first book with Gerhardt, has made me reconsider my whole life's work. I suddenly see books where I only saw pictures because I'd never thought that my pictures would, you know, interest a publisher as a book. So in addition to the fact that being there uh, at, in Göttingen and working in that amazing factory 
that is top to bottom devoted to making the most beautiful container for beautiful things, a container that is its best final form. It, it was humbling because the, pe the books I saw on press and uh, stacked up in sheets and uh, the people I was talking to, it felt as though, well, it felt to me like being in the early years of the rebirth, I think, of serious photography in the 60s. Maybe it was the birth in terms of the larger public. But I remember the feeling of those years. It was like a group of converts to a new religion. And uh, it was made more passionate, I think, by the fact that really very few people understood what we were so passionate about. They're just photographs, after all. Um, and all of us who grew up in that era have seen things obviously turn, I don't know <coughs> how, maybe it's like 540 degrees or 720 degrees. 180 doesn't seem to really comprehend it. But, and I think a large part, or certainly a significant part of the way in which photography has entered the world now is due to publishers like Gerhardt, but the thing is there aren't any publishers like Gerhardt except Gerhardt, so I think we'd have to say thank you, Gerhardt, because you've changed things for all of us, and uh, I'm just very grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. This is a book, and uh, the title of the book is uh, Landscape as Longing, Queens, New York. The authors are Frank Golke, Joel Sternfeld, and Suketu Meta. Suketu Meta, of course, is not a photographer, and uh, he delivered something which is positioned here and hidden at the end of the book. Uh, it is a little booklet. Uh, with uh, a text. And you know, uh, with uh, photography books, I don't like it too much when the book itself delivers an interpretation of the work. A text for me in a photo book, in an artistic photo book, is good when it is coming directly from the author, or if it is something which catches up the spirit and the idea of the book and transforms it into a text which delivers something what photography cannot deliver. So a combination of both of them for me makes the perfect book. And um, Meta will read a chapter from his text. And uh, by the way, as uh, we are running out of time, um, I had the idea uh, to translate, uh, your text is really brilliant, and uh, it was um, it was one of the most exciting thing I have read within the last years. And I want to translate uh, the text into German language and publish it uh, at a German book of literature. So, if you accept it, that could be our next uh, adventure. <laughs> so, and uh, now, please uh, let us uh, hear your voice. Thank you, Gerard. This is such an honor uh, to be here with um, three of my favorite photographers, uh, including Robert, who I know well. Um, well, when Joel approached me to write um, some sort of text that would go along with this book of photographs about a place that I know intimately well because it's where I came with my family at the age of 14 from Bombay against my will. I was 
brought here kicking and screaming to Jackson Heights in Queens. So I grew up there, so I really know this place. And I feel like, you know, anyone that's going to come in and take photographs of Queens, like they've got to run it by me because I know what Queens is. <laughs> and then when I saw their brilliant photographs, I knew this was an enterprise that I wanted to be part of. So Joel asked me if I, there was something that I could write a text that would go along with it. And I, I'm writing a book about New York and immigration in New York, so I've got lots of nonfiction about it. And I wrote and rewrote several drafts of these different essays. And all of it seemed much too grounded in time and space. And the, their, their photographs are so transcendent, they're so evocative, um, there's a subtlety and finesse about those photos that I felt nothing that I could write that would be journalistic would do justice to this book. So I decided to run something by Joel, which was uh, not nonfiction, but fiction. And it's the story of an Indian immigrant. And Queens, as we know, is um, all about immigration. More than half of people living in Queens today are foreign born. Uh, the place I grew up in, the zip code 11372, there's more languages spoken in that zip code than any other in the country. Um, so I wrote um, a long short story. Um, it's called What is Remembered? And um, I'll just read the first very brief section, not a chapter, don't worry, um, at the beginning of the story, which um, it's, it's about this Indian immigrant. When Mahesh stepped off the plane from India at JFK, his first experience of the new world was a powerful static shock from the carpeting. It was so powerful that he vibrated in place for a moment and then sailed forth into New York, humming with energy. God damn, New York, fast cars, zoom. He ran past immigration, past baggage claim, past customs, and leapt into a taxi which carried him at great speed to his university. Mahesh's sub subsequent career at the university in the business world was marked most of all by this energy. He did everything slightly faster than others. Unfortunately, the static charge had also wiped out a small but vital part of his memory, his mother's name. This in itself would not be such a disaster. He always referred to his mother and thought of her as, as mummy. But what was, was distressing was that since forgetting his mother's name, he was gradually forgetting other things about his family too, such as his father's occupation, where his grandparents lived, the correct term for his maternal uncle, his caste, but as the years went by and Mahesh forgot more and more he worried less and less about it. After all, he was well settled in American society. He was in a part of the country where there were few Indians, and nobody asked him more than a few cursory questions about his origins, such as, where's your family in India? Are you Hindu or Muslim? Hindu. Gradually, this was all that was left in Mahesh's memory, that his family was in India and that he was Hindu. What was his family doing? Were they dead? Did they come to America and try to contact him? Did they write letters to his previous addresses which were sent back? Were they angry with him? Had they given him up for dead? Had they also forgotten his name? Mahesh did not know the answers because he had not even asked the questions. All that remained with Mahesh of the things that he had brought over when he came was something he had found in his pocket, whose purpose or significance he could not explain. A hairpin, an ordinary black woman's hairpin. So that's the beginning of the story. And then uh, Mahesh um, somehow finds himself driving off with an Indian family and finds himself in Jackson Heights, which he's never been in, or as we Indians who grew up in the place call it Jackson Heights. <laughs> uh, and what we found, uh, what I found in um, uh, Joel and Frank's book, 
is exactly this, landscape as longing, which it always has been for me. Um, I grew up in Jackson Heights, and I commuted to NYU uh, as a, a, a teenager. Um, because my parents wouldn't allow me to live in the NYU dorms because I might get Americanized. <laughs> and now I teach at NYU, so I commute to Jackson Heights because I'm writing this book <laughs> about immigrants in Queens. Um, and I think this book couldn't have arrived at a better time because the entire planet is being menaced by a man from Queens, ostensibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we need this brilliant book to serve as a corrective, uh, that it is a place full of longing, full of newcomers, um, full of people who carry um, these other worlds with them, that it is, as the character in my story says, it's the middle world. It's neither here nor there. It's a place that is hospitable to all of us, any of us who are possessed by longing. Thank you.